Marcus. George was a remarkable man. I never met him. Um, I came to New York City in 1967, in June of 67. I think George died in 1967. Um, and the reason I got involved is because in 1968, um, or late 1967, I forget, except I remember it was summertime, so maybe it was either summertime of 67 or summertime 68. Um, Marion McPartland called and said that George's drums had been left at the last club in which he worked, which was called Bill's Gay Nineties, was uh, up on the in the 50s on the east side and it it was in a townhouse and you had to climb I don't know eight nine ten steps to get up to the level where the performance area was and I guess George had gotten sufficiently ill that he couldn't he just was not strong enough to climb the stairs and then subsequently he was put in the hospital where he he died of cancer he, the, the drums were left there, and Marion said that, uh, Hank, you're a, you're a jazz fan. I know you didn't know George, but you're a jazz fan, and you um, uh, have a car, and you're young and strong, uh, so <laughs> it's your obligation to go get the drums and taking, take them to Jean, his grieving widow, over on 57th and 9th. And I said, okay. I was 27 or so, and ready to go get them. So I did. I got the drums and loaded them into my little Volkswagen, filled it up pretty good, and um, took them over to 57th Street and 9th Avenue. And Gene and George had lived on the fifth floor, which was no big deal. I mean, they had an elevator and stuff like that. But not that day. It was out. <laughs> Their elevator wasn't working. So I hauled all the drums and the cases and the kits and this and that upstairs and uh, knocked on the door uh, and uh, Gene was there and was not having a good day. I don't think that she had had a good day in many days, uh, but um, I think that both Gene and George uh, knew where most of the bottles were kept. and. They were all pretty much empty by then. Anyway, I brought all the drums in, and it was a decent-sized apartment, and um, I looked around. I, I knew that George painted. I didn't know that he painted as much as he did. I had seen one of his pictures at Eddie Condon's. Eddie had one above the mantelpiece uh, at his apartment down on Washington Square, and <clears throat> Anyway, I talked to Jean for a bit, and she was very excited about the paintings because she said that um, she was going to give them all to the corner saloon for $300 worth of credit that she could drink up, which would have probably taken her about 10 minutes. But anyhow, um, I said, no, that's, that's a pretty dumb idea. Um, I said, I'll bet there are a lot of jazz fans and collectors and stuff out there who would be happy to pay $300 for a picture. And um, she says, oh yeah? And I says, oh yeah. I says, let me come up here and take some photographs of these things and I'll show, show them to my friends. And so, Anyway, to make a long story short, I went up and I took, uh, I had a little fixed focus camera at that time and I took some Kodachromes of many of the pictures and we managed to I, I bought one right off um, Squirrel Ashcraft bought two Marion bought one um, Johnny Aronson bought one anyway we got rid of of I don't know seven or eight or nine right off and here here was you know say there were nine that's twenty seven hundred dollars so she Jean was very happy about that. In any event, uh, oh, and uh, Roselle Davis bought one, Stuart Davis's widow. Um, anyway, we moved forward and 
the 60s became the 70s, and I stayed in touch with Jean because um, she would, she'd call me occasionally and say, hey, I found another painting in the back of the closet, and, uh, or when she needed to pay the phone bill or something like that. She would need $30 or, or whatever. And I know that I got Bob Altshuler bought all of, of George's 78 records, some of which were, you know, scarce old records from the 1920s. And um, not only bought them, but gave Gene a whole box full of Columbia LPs and a, and a player to play them on. And time passed, and in about 1980, the telephone rang, and it was the super of the building where uh, Gene lived, and he told me she had died. And um, could I do anything? I said, well, I'm not a relative, I'm not anything. I said, why are you calling me? She said, well, the phone book next to her bed was open, and it was open to O, and your name is there, and so I'm calling you. And, and the story was that uh, Jean had, I, I guess, pretty serious cancer, um, didn't know it, um, and had gone across the street to Roosevelt Hospital, had gone into the emergency room, very, very, very ill, and um, died within a day or two or something. Had no identification with her, and it took some while for them to even discover who she was. Finally they did, they tracked her back to this apartment and so forth. And he said, would you come up here and help me try and figure something out? And I said, okay. So I called Phyllis Condon, who was the only person I knew who actually knew Jean Wetling. Um, and that was, I guess I could have called Marion, but she was out on the island. But anyhow, um, we um, went up to the apartment and it turns out that the, it was like in the movies. There were literally people in the hallway wanting to take stuff. You know, I, I want the TV, I want the table, I want the chair, that kind of thing. And so Phyllis and I went in and looked around and I, the, the super gave me the phone book and I remembered then, I don't now, I mean, because this is, we're talking 50 years ago, I remember Jean's maiden name, which I just don't recall. And I called, I looked through the phone book, and I found the same name, and it was of a guy, and it turned out it was her brother. And he lived in Arizona, New Mexico, somewhere like that. And I called him, and <laughs> I told him that his sister had died, and he said, I don't give a damn, you can throw everything in the apartment into the street and never call me again, boom, and hung up. And hear all the people in the hallway, I want the chair, I want the TV kind of thing. So I gathered up a box, pretty good sized box like this, and I, I went through the apartment as best as I could, um, putting things in the box that had to do with George. Uh, like, he, he had lots of little sketchbooks that looked like this. It turned out that there were 13 or 14 of them. Uh, drawing exercise with an apple, it says. And uh, it's, this, this sketchbook is, is full of things that, that, that he did. But there were dozens of these things. There were um, uh, scrapbooks, there were albums of photographs, and I thought to myself, well this, you know, this is, it's, it's silly to put this in a dumpster, so I just put it in the box. Anything I could find that had to do with George, we threw in the box. And this was sketches. Uh, in a, a couple of instances, we did find one small painting that Jean hadn't told anybody about, which was this one. Um, it is not the world's greatest painting, but it's George's first, and was actually exhibited in the late 40s at a 
serious show uh, on 57th Street as my first piece. <laughs> and anyway, he got a lot better a lot quicker. But um, in any event, um, bundled all this stuff up, um, took it home, and basically put it on a shelf. Uh, I wound up putting the sketchbooks in a box. Some of the, the little sketches, just for fun, I framed and hung at the studio downtown uh, when I had downtown sound. Made frames for them. I mean, here was a little drawing that he made that was... Uh, Hold that so I can zoom in on it. Okay. This was, uh, this was called Hash. Uh, and here was a sketch for a painting that he did that actually Squirrel Ashcraft wound up buying um, that was called, if you see at the bottom, it says Lee. It was for Lee Wiley. And, um, but there were lots of those. And then here was one that was Pee Wee Russell. But this is done with a great big marker. Those were done with ink pens. And um, anyway, uh, put all these things and I framed up a handful of the drawings and put the photographs that I could find um, in uh, big binders like this that would have pictures of George. Uh, I mean, the one here on the left is George in his... Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that um, I mean, he played with Paul Whiteman for a lot of years. Um, he was a, an extreme, uh, extremely accomplished guy. And in looking through all of, more recently since I've scanned all this material, um, I found a notation that um, in the early 50s, when he was um, on staff at ABC, ABC was going to try and put together a, a symphonic orchestra to rival the NBC Symphony. And George Wetling was going to be the timpanist in that orchestra. And I don't think most folks who think about George Wetling think of him as playing a timpani in a, a symphony. But apparently the Arthur Rosinski or whoever it was that was going to lead the band um, thought that he had sufficient talent to do that. In any event, there were pictures, there were um, hundreds and hundreds of pictures, and boxes full of things that um, I didn't realize that he had taken um, until I started going through some, uh, there were three scrapbooks that um, were uh, in the pile of things, they were falling apart, but they, they showed what, uh, uh, that, that he took pictures. Um, Let, let's hold for the yeah. scrapbooks for one second. Uh -huh. 